Why is it important to talk about the policing of black women and children through the child welfare system? I'm here with Erin Cloud from BronxDefenders.org, and I'm Kathy Martelli from the IntimacyDojo.com. And Erin, you're going to be talking about this at the Woodhall Sexual Freedom Summit. Such an important topic, and I'd love to hear, like, can you give us some juicy details from your talk or from your work? Absolutely. It's an incredibly important topic that's really not discussed frequently or openly amongst many people, even people who care and are well-intended. Um, what we're going to be talking about in our presentations is the womb to foster care pipeline. Mm -hmm. So our managing director Emma Kettingham at Bronx Defenders kind of coined this term womb to foster care pipeline because what we were seeing was that women, low income women, black women, Latinx women uh, were hiding their pregnancies in fear that their children were going to be removed. And this was a well-founded fear mm -hmm. that their children were going to be removed from them at birth uh, because they had systemic involvement with the foster care system. So if they had a prior child that was in foster care, used to be in foster care, then they were more likely to lose their child at childbirth and almost immediately lose their child at childbirth. Not even more likely, they actually would guarantee the fact that that would happen. Oh my God. And so our office wanted to intervene and create a solution that would help these women keep their children in a way that was centered in black women, centered in women of color, centered in their voices, and not in a model that was steeped in patriarchy and white supremacy that is largely dripping within the foster care system as of present. Yeah, and oh my God, if they're having to hide it so they can keep their child, they're not getting the resources. You can't go and ask for help, the help that our culture, our, our, we're supposed to offer them. They, they couldn't even ask for that. That'd be so awful. Exactly. I mean, when we're looking at a reproductive justice model, we're thinking, what is your right to have a child if you choose to have a child and your right to be able to parent that child free from government intrusion, your right to choice. And a lot of times what we were seeing is that people's conversations ended at birth. There was a lot of conversation about access to choice, but not as much conversation about how that access to choice and then your right to actually parent the child and how those things were interconnected with each other and the fight for reproductive liberty for all women, especially women of color. So their life is surrounded by all these different policing units that sometimes we don't even consider to be policing units. And so they're living under a microscope. And as you can imagine, as women, we make mistakes, live our lives, but if you're under a microscope, those mistakes are amplified in a way that are incredibly punitive uh, for women of color in a way that is, can be scary to leave the judgment in the child welfare system. So when you add you know, the reasons why that women, black women are over police with a very real and persistent stigmatization of our own bodies and who we are as women, it makes us particularly vulnerable. And it makes us especially vulnerable when we need to seek treatment and support for our bodies and for ourselves. And what we saw is that many of our clients and these women, they didn't want to seek prenatal care from their doctors because they didn't feel like they could openly and candidly have trusting relationships with those doctors. If you are looking at your childbirth and thinking, all I want to do is leave with this child, which is in <laughs> biologically important, right? Like that's our first instinct as a parent is that you want to your child to survive mm -hmm. and you want to care for that child. And you're not thinking like, how am I feeling right now? What is going on in my body? Am I healing? How am I listening to myself? And so some of the things that we've seen, and, you know, I was my colleague who's going to be presenting with me, Melissa Hamilton, who actually just gave birth, which is why she's not here. Mm -hmm. um, talks about the fact that, you know, women are frequently given C-sections and they're not going back to treatment for C-sections because they're that relationship that doctor is broken. They are sitting in court for multiple days at a time on hard benches, not having any consultation or any consideration about their health with, you know, infected uh, C-section scars. Could you tell me what some, you know, why do you choose Woodhull as, as one of your venues for sharing this? So we really want to be in spaces that are, are reproductive justice models and talking about the framework. Because I think often as I, I am a public defender and I represent women in the child welfare system, and very often these different arenas are very segmented, reproductive justice, public health, mm. and criminal justice. But they're really and, all blended yeah, together. they're not blending all together. But the reality is that we're looking at the same woman. Mm -hmm. 
the, this woman is going through all these different systems and she's one person, but we're all sitting in silo talking about these issues. Mm -hmm. And what I wanted to do and what our office wanted to do is make sure that the voices of these women are centered within these conversations. Because so often when we're thinking about reproductive justice, the conversation really focuses on abortion, right to cho choose. And it doesn't really talk about what's happening with many of our clients, which is the oppression that child protective workers are placing on their actual autonomous birthing and choice and ability to procreate and have children. And for many of my clients, that really is a government form of oppression to their own procreation and liberties and thereof.